that uh, glowing endorsement and introduction. Um, and I thank everyone for uh, welcoming me up here in New Hampshire. It's always a pleasure uh, to come up here and uh, speak with you folks. Um, before I get started, I think first I should probably just further qualify myself. I'm really just an angry country boy. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not a big fancy guy like Hal that makes it throughout the uh, whole Northeast here. I was born in Ware, Massachusetts. Grew up the next town over, uh, right in my young adulthood, and now I live about 300 yards from the hospital I was born in. And um, I'm involved in local government. I, I believe in giving a little back and contributing. Uh, a number of years ago, I got tired of uh, seasonal layoffs, went to college, studied the environmental sciences, plant and soil, got my degree in that. So I, I do have a formal education in the environmental sciences. And uh, I started a small business for myself. And when the housing market tanked, that was kind of the end of that, because uh, pretty much everything that I did was tailored towards um, serving uh, the housing market. Um, I did stay active in uh, municipal government, though. As Hal said, I chair the Conservation Commission. I chair our town's Open Space Committee. And I'm one of the founding members of the Ag Committee in town, the Agricultural uh, Committee. And uh, I enjoy doing that. It, you know, I, uh, I really am attached to my area of the state. I like my friends and neighbors. Uh, I like the area. Um, I'm not one of those that is going to try to pull a geographical solution when things get tough to go to another state. Because things like what we're talking about here tonight, um, it's like a, a net that's been cast over not only the country, but other nations of the world, too. So for me, there's no geographical fix for this. Um, I decided to dig my heels in and, and fight for what's mine right in my own neighborhood. So um, I'm also the town's conservation agent. And at that capacity, I uh, provide guidance to a lot of the administrative work of the commission. Um, and I'd like to reiterate some of uh, two things that are very important. Um, I'm up here today speaking as an individual. Uh, I was not sent here by my commissions, any of those that I uh, represent. I'm not here at any official municipal capacity. I'm here out of my own individual concern and uh, drawing uh, my talking points from public documents. So I like to make that uh, very clear uh, to begin with. And I do have an affinity for protecting the environment. I was one of those kids, I grew up in the, the sticks of Belchertown and I was one of those kids that was constantly out catching snakes in the swamp and raising tadpoles in a bucket and, and uh, you know, that's just stayed with me through my whole life. And today I still enjoy very much uh, being out in the environment. I'm not an office person. Now, Agenda 21, I've, I've known about that. I've always read a little bit beyond what the TV spoon feeds to us uh, on a nightly basis. Uh, the internet's a great thing. It's uh, certainly a double-edged sword. There's a lot of not cases out there, but um, there's pretty uh, easy access to almost any document that you might want to read. Um, and, I, and I did a lot of dabbling in that. And I realized that we were kind of going down a, a path that was, uh, as Hal uh, um, stated, is not at all what our founders set out for us. So I guess I was a little tense in the overall transition that I was seeing as I uh, went through my young adulthood and especially after I had a family, when you have a couple of kids to uh, think about, your, your whole life changes, and it certainly did for me anyways. And I began to worry about their future. So Agenda 21 is one of those things I stumbled on. It was a comprehensive plan that seemed to affect each and every one of us in almost every aspect of our lives. Uh, it's a 40-chapter document, and there's some chapters that are committed specifically to public education, some to the environment, <coughs> others to housing and development. Uh, economics, it literally touches every aspect of our life. So I, I, I can't say that I studied it thoroughly. I have read it. Um, I read other editorials about it. And it, it was just always in the back of my mind. And as the years go on, and, and I've been, I think, eight, nine years serving it, uh, with the Conservation Commission, you know, I, I've seen a transition uh, in Massachusetts in particular Back in the 90s, they dissolved county government for the most part. Our sheriffs have been relegated to handing out restraining orders and things like that. And much of county regional government was uh, disassembled. And oddly enough, the same talking heads 
almost immediately started saying, hey, you know what? This might be a very efficient and cost-effective way of doing business is to regionalize. Now, we just had a regional system that was based on counties. They said it was too corrupt and too expensive and had to tear it down, and they did. And now they want to do it again. That was very odd for those of us that don't rely 100% on television. Is they just kind of contradicted themselves right there. Well, what they reconstructed wasn't anything that observed the, the powers of the sheriff, for example. It was an administrative layer. It was another whole layer. And if you recall your civics, you have federal, state, and local, and then we have three branches of government. Well, regionalization exists in legal outer space. It is not local, it's not state, and it is not federal. So we just created something that we don't quite know what it is. We can't quite define it. Um, it, it shifts a little bit. As, as you'll see, uh, regional planners uh, have their maps in their own regions that they're dedicated to, and there's overlap with some of them. But um, again, we saw local communities acquiescing um, control. And I don't use that word control as in a... Uh, dictatorial, but in managing your own uh, endeavors locally. Because really, that's the way things are supposed to be, is the people need to, you know, where most of the laws exist, is where the, the people have <coughs> communication with their legislators. That's kind of your selectmen and your city councilors. And the, the higher you go, shall we say, uh, you know, to state and federal level, the less authority, the less control, and, and least amount of laws. That whole thing has been turned up upside down on its head right now, and a lot of things are coming onto us from above. And this is the perfect system that they, they've set up to do this. Now, more recently, what really, really put up red flags with me is I started, that I knew that sustainable development was working its way. It was a policy of the state now in many states of the, of the union. And I started getting correspondence from our, our regional planners. Now, these are entities, I, I, I went online from 47 pages, got about maybe a dozen, a little more of, of regional planners that are working in our state, and the other 47 pages are all land trusts that they work in, in conjunction with. Now, these regional planners have a regional plan, obviously, and in, in our uh, area, it's called Valley Vision 2. And the wording of that, and it's a pretty thick document, just above and beyond your local zoning bylaws and such. Um, well, these groups were communicating with our offices, all the conservation, community development, open space. Um, and one came through my office. They weren't smart enough to hide all the emails from me, so I will be communicating with all these people in my <laughs> state. But um, in here, they say they want to help us again. And they, they would like to um, consider, have us consider a regional conservation agent. All right, so our town and you know, all these towns are being asked to give up some more control from their local conservation commissions to a regional conservation agent. Okay, so I read on and I go to see, well, what is it uh, exactly that they feel that they can do for us? And they started listing things that they, they are focused on uh, achieving, and it all has to do with the acquisition of private property. Your conservation commissions, if you look at the Wetlands Protection Act, there are eight interests of the act. That is what our focus is. Not one of those was represented <coughs> in what was proposed to us. So towns, they're, they're awful quick when someone says, this won't cost you anything. They say, okay, well, if you leave us alone, we agree, go away. And that's kind of what's happening. People are are at the local level are not reviewing these things with the credence that they deserve. And I suspect in going through the list and knowing some of these agents, they're just green and earthy crunchy enough to go hook, line, and sinker, give up their local controls to a regional planner who's going to come down with a regional plan that they're going to be asked to endorse. Almost at the same time that I, I'm getting things like this through my office, I noticed that one of the hearing items, our, our secretary uh, for the select board is very good at sending out notices and agendas for the meeting. So I look through every single one that comes to my inbox. 
And I noticed that the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission had an agenda item for um, acceptance of an update, a minor update to the existing land use plan. Well, it's about three or four pages long, and it's about three and a half to four and a half pages of techno babble and reiterations, but buried in the fine print was one little resolve that said that all of the undersigned uh, agreed uh, in support pending state zoning legislation. Wouldn't even name it, wouldn't give a bill number. And I immediately went uh, kind of ballistic and went in and said, please tell me you're not going to agree and, and sign off on this. Okay, have any of you read CLRPA? And when they started asking me what's a CLRPA, I realized they didn't read the zoning legislation that they were about to provide a backdoor endorsement for. These people are trained professionals. They're not regular folks like yourselves that want to go and work 40 hours and get a paycheck. They are activists at what they do. This, we, we, if you leave here with anything, let that be one thing that you understand. These are activists. And their goal is to get those towns, and there's a number of them, I think there's 43 in the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission's region. <coughs> there's a signature spot for every one of them. And the moment they get that signature, I know I'm going to be bumping up into them at the state house because they're going to go up and lobby our legislators and say, hey, town of where or the town of whatever thinks that this new zoning legislation is a great idea. Well, I immediately went to, to find out what this zoning legislation was. And the name right up front will probably send shivers up the spine too. Was called the Comprehensive Land Use Reform and Policies <coughs> Act. It's a conglomeration of two massive bills, one that hasn't been able to pass under its own merits for literally decades, and another one that's kind of new with this Green Revolution, the Partnerships Act. Now, you all remember what happens when government and corporations uh, get in cahoots and manipulate the control of production. It's not quite a free enterprise system anymore. It's, uh, something that more resembles fascism. That's the relationship that's starting to occur between green nonprofits and our governments. And uh, I'll prove that to you with some examples right from my own backyard. Well, in here, they're talking about lots of uh, things like limitations on local authority, legitimate property rights. Property rights are absolute. We'll talk more about that. Promoting overriding state interests. I know the creatures that wrote this they need, need to go back to basic civics. They got the whole thing upside down on its head. Under a, a constitutional republic, there's no such thing as overriding state interests. They're interested in what we tell them to be interested in. They've now got it backwards. And the reason they've got it backwards is back in the 90s and 95, the federal government gave the APA, the American Planning Association, an NGO, registered and certified through the UN for implementation of Agenda 21, gave them $5 billion to create off-the-shelf plans for uh, regional, countywide uh, comprehensive land use plans in, in the, all 50 states. They are mandated to have a plan. Whether the cooperation and the input from the municipalities is, uh, is not to be concerned. It's the fact that they are going to have a plan. So that's why we've got regional planning commissions now. And I'm sure even up here in New Hampshire, they're called by a variety of different names, <laughs> but they're basically a, a regional entity that creates land use plans that are off the shelf. They will come to your communities and again, they'll probably say, well, this won't cost you anything. Our engineers will do all the work. We'll do all the design. We'll do the paperwork. <coughs> and if you start scratching below the surface, you'll find the science falls apart. you find that we have the fox guarding the hen house half the time. Um, and, and that's just what this reads like. I went through here, and they're now legislating and regulating for view and aesthetics. So if you're uh, someone who's in a smart growth uh, section of town, and you look up on the hillside and you like to see nothing but trees, well, maybe your rights, according to this legislation, exceed the property rights of the person who actually owns that parcel who may have been paying taxes on that for years to give to his kids or his grandkids for whatever reason. It's his uh, piece of property to do with what he, he 
sees fit. Yeah, we've got language in here now that's about to regulate an individual's property based on someone else's well, perception of aesthetics. Very, very dangerous. Um, you see um, reflections, uh, and Hal touched on it, and I want to go into a few more examples. We talk about what is sustainable and what is not sustainable. Fish ponds, farmlands and rangelands, single family home, harvesting of timber, dams and reservoirs. Near where I am, the next town over, they're proposing to take down a dam. Fifty years ago, there was a factory there that employed a couple hundred people. There was a fire there since, and, and uh, the factory went down after that, obviously. But they generated power from that dam to run that factory that employed all those people. Now we've got smart growth conditions where that factory is now Section 8 housing, or low-income housing, and if you listen to the talking heads, they're going to tell you it's not feasible today to generate power, hydropower, to, to run that Section 8 village. Now, I mean, to me that doesn't pass a straight face test. If we could do it 50 or 75 years ago, the technology has only advanced, we've only gotten better at it, and we're now told that that's unsustainable. Well, they realize that that dam being there is actually a resource to people in that entire area, and you can, in fact, generate power from such things. It's regulation that stands in the way. That's why it's so expensive and cost prohibitive. Not because of the technology, the raw technology. It's the permitting. So it's being regulated out of existence. And if you go through the entire document, the Global Biodiversity Assessment Report, it, it literally goes after the, the heart of what we are as a, a country, what we are as a community. It makes those things that are assets to our daily life unsustainable, according to their language. And you'll see a direct correlation with the pending bills. And again, this is Massachusetts, but rest assured that this exists in your legislature too. One of the speeches that Al and I did, we were approached afterwards by one of your representatives and uh, I think you may have some legislation coming down the road that would advance your, and secure your private property rights, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, this is everywhere. And I, I told my town, when I went into that selectman's meeting, and I said, you know, you're going to sign off on this. You're going to get, they're going to use it as a backdoor endorsement. And I put up such a stink that, it, to make a long story short, they said, all right, I'll tell you what. Let's kick this over to the planning board. Let them have at it. Let them make a recommendation, and we'll rule on this later. So off to the planning board we go. I followed it right over there. I sat right down with them, and out come the papers and the three by five glossies, and I, I explained everything that I tried to do in summary to the selectmen. And lo and behold, they rejected it unanimously. So we go back to the selectmen, and uh, they had promised me that. Uh, to calm my nerves and to satisfy my concerns, that they would actually have uh, come into the next meeting the gentleman who was a senior contributor to CLERCO. He wrote the bill. What is CLERCO? What is it, CLERCO? This is a proposed statewide reform of our Chapter 40 zoning. So it's Massachusetts zoning law completely rewritten. Comprehensive Land Use Reform and Partnerships Act. Okay, so this is still in the proposal stage. It came out of the last session in the final hours. It reported out unanimously, just as a, a token to the, those that sponsored the bill. Um, what I'm hearing is it's kind of stalled there now for all the same reasons it was before. It's a giant land grab. I mean, there, there are many unconstitutional provisions in this alone. Um, so this is going to have a, a problem passing again on its own merits. Well. I'm all encouraged now. I said, I get to square off with the guy that wrote this bill. <coughs> and I was pretty excited about it because I did a little bit of research. I went to the meeting. He didn't show. Um, the selectmen decided, well, maybe the planning board was confused, so let's send them back with more information and send some people from Pioneer Valley this time, and we'll straighten them out real good, and maybe they'll vote right. Well, the man's name is Jeff Lacey. He's no stranger to regional planning. And he is the town planner for the town of Shipsbury. 
this is Shoes Carry Zoning Map. Okay, looks uh, fairly benign. Um, in most towns in Massachusetts, thank you, um, they have a zoning designation called Rural Residential. Is that familiar? They have something similar to that here. All right, here it's called Roadside Residential. All right, if you're lucky enough to live within a couple hundred feet of these north, south, east, west roads, and if you look very closely, this is just a network of streets. There are families, and there are farms, and there are businesses, and there are schools, and there are daycares, and small businesses all over here. Okay? <coughs> this, this is industry. This is the economic motor of Shootsbury right here. All business and industry exists in this little uh, pink little cube right there. This is conservation. When we look in Clerpa, what they call sending zones corresponds with our conservation. What they call receiving zones are these few where they actually want single family homes. They are going to create conditions that are so intolerable and insurmountable, whether it's through fees, whether it's through regular conservation <coughs> restrictions, they're going to make it so you have no choice as they foreclose. I don't know if you heard, but they're foreclosing on homes. Towns are taking homes for tax title. Okay, and when this happens, what's one of the tricks they use? They just got to call maybe this section over here. We'll call that redevelopment. Blighted, you know. Green grand dollar is going to come in by the bucketfuls. And let's say there's only 40% of the homes in there that are, have been foreclosed on and vacant. The other 60% are people that are getting by, on their homes, paying their bill, doing their thing. You fall into a blight zone or an area of redevelopment, they're going to use eminent domain. Now, this is where I couldn't get my head around this years ago. Agenda 21 was proposing things that I'm saying, are they, what are they going to bulldoze the houses off the face of the earth? And the answer is yes, they are. They most certainly are. Now, I tell you, this, look at what Shrewsbury has done with itself. This is what socialism looks like on a zoning map. This is unsustainable. It's a vision of unsustainability. These people need to work, and I guarantee all the jobs aren't there. They're parasitic on all the communities around them. And now we're looking at it statewide. You see a pattern? Once you're stuffed into one of these stack them and pack them Section 8 low-income residential cubicles, well then you're not a consumer anymore because consumerism is unsustainable. We own too many things. If people are going to watch this on TV, you've got too many things if you've got a TV to watch it on. <laughs> you're not going to be much of a consumer if you live on the eighth floor of one of their, uh, their uh, low-income housing blocks. You're not going to have things out in your yard. You're going to get fines. If you go out and plant a half dozen tomatoes on the side of your, your wall, you get fined for that, you see. You're not supposed to tamper in these zones. You're very highly regulated, you know. Out in here, the activity is by, usually, the leftist environmentals. In here, the right-wing business uh, nonprofits. So we're getting it from both sides. Thank you very much. <coughs> Okay, so this is, uh, I'm not up here and going to beat up on any one party. I'm telling you, they're both part and parcel to the problem. So how do the environmentalists work? One day, I, I, in my office, I get a stack of 40 vernal pool certifications. You know what a vernal pool is, or ever heard the term? Yeah. It's a seasonal impoundment that holds water, and certain amphibians uh, tend to breed in these things. They're usually fishless. They hold water only part of the time, dry the rest of the year. In the summer, July and August, you could walk right through one and never know. I'm in favor of, of recognizing and saving these habitats because they're a great barometer of local environmental health. Um, as a matter of fact, when I was in college, I was a <coughs> local herpetological celebrity for about 30 days. When I went out um, seasonally, these things, uh, there's only one or two days a year that they migrate. And I went out and I grabbed three of them because I was going to do a presentation at my kid's school. Two of the three of them had five legs and six feet. Mm -hmm. So I 
the way you can go out, nice uh, independent studies through college. It was really kind of cool. I, I learned a lot out of it. Realized the value of these habitats. But, you know, when I went to my town and I, I got appointed to those positions and I raised my hand, I took an oath to the Constitution first and foremost. You know, I'm not there to push laws, so they, they're not going to have a a useful idiot out of me to push this type of garbage. I, I took an oath to the Constitution and I recognized that private property rights are one of the pillars that made this country what it is. When we talk about the word exceptionalism, it's often confused with some imperialistic John around the world. And that's not what makes us exceptional. Is we're one of the few countries, if not the only country, on the planet that combines the unique right of our freedoms and our liberties in combination with the right to own property because that is without a doubt where all wealth is created. If you put an addition on your home or a swimming pool or started a small business you have some property that you put up as collateral and if your business plan was solid and you grew you reinvested what you had gained in, in uh, tangibles and in property and in value you would reinvest and you would grow. I don't care if you're, you're Apple or if you're Joe's Coffee Shop. It started and it is rooted firmly in your right to own property. Another thing you've got to take out of this tonight is that without property rights, and it is the first plank of the Communist Manifesto, it's integral that, that, that we protect and fight for our property rights. Mm -hmm. And again, do it in a nonpartisan way because this ain't Republican or Democratic or fine. They both in hell showed us uh, quite clearly. Uh, Bush signed it in a soft law. It only needs administrative approval, not legislative approval. Clinton followed up with the President's Council on Sustainable Development. And what did they do? They incorporated what's called Sustainable America. And that came from the APA. The APA and ICWI, they're the same. All right? One has got a poison taproot here in America, which is the APA, in Italy, which we all kind of recognize now, that I, that international, tipped off a lot of people and they realized what they were dealing with there. So they're instituting this through policies. They tried to ramrod a big chunk of it through with the Biodiversity Treaty. I'll show that map, okay? This is what the United States would look like. All the red is off limits. The orange is buffer zones, highly regulated, but we may let you tread on those. And you'll see these little black spots here and there. Well, that's where all the human residential zones are. That's where you're going to live. And this is where you're not going to be. If you've got a home there, you won't. If you've got a business there, you won't. So they're instituting this through a system that is not quite legislative. The treaty didn't make it because uh, the UN lied to the council and they found out with one hour to spare and with Dr. Michael Kaufman that was largely responsible for squashing that. So they had to have the global global. That's what we're seeing. The battleground for this stuff is not in Washington, D.C. and it's not at New York or at the UN Tower. It's right in your own town. These are all off-the-shelf plans all right, billions of dollars were given to the APA. They shared those with your regional planners, I assure you. The language is all there. And it's being instituted piecemeal. So that, these little, that makes it easier. If for them it does, it goes right under the radar. No, no, it makes it easier for us to fight it. Yes, it does. A lot of the times people will realize how big this is and how encompassing it is, and, and they're fearful. They say, oh my God, there's nothing we can do. Right. There absolutely is. Because the one thing is for sure, and uh, you all must pay attention to your uh, selectmen's meetings and city councilors' meetings, they're concerned with money. They're concerned with liability. When you tell them that they're, you know, they're on the hook and they're liable for X, Y, or Z, they tend to listen. And oddly enough, when you prove to them they're about to give up local controls, they listen to that too. Because they get pressure on their people. The people are tired of cookie cutter things just being apply because you know we're the ones that are paying the taxes we're the ones that have to spend nine months to put a swimming pool in so we're feeling the pinch and who hears that most directly is our selectmen so that that's why all, all the, the majority of laws should come at that local level there should be more laws in your town than there is in DC completely on its head right now but you're correct 
it is easier for us to have access to these things and, and hold them up. I'm happy to say there's a half dozen folks that I know that picked this information up, studied it, understood it, and got on their conservation and their open space committees, and they're making a difference. My concern is that it may be easier to work with them, but that's only the people who become aware of this understand what this really is. I'd like to know how I can become more aware that if this comes to my town, how do I help stop it? It's already there. I can assure you some flavor of it is already there. How entrenched it is, I don't know. Um, but you've got to look through community development, because they pigeonhole a lot of money. You'll notice the community development, the CPA, these are all things that funnel money that can somehow, some way, support Agenda 21. The language about conservation. Let me, I, mean, I definitely got to get this, uh, this in, because it will prove to you beyond a shadow of a doubt and everything isn't what you, it seems to be. Land trust. I initially, hook, line, and sinker, I said, these are great organizations. They're out to protect the environment, save farms. <coughs> but this is pretty cool. Well, it was cool until one formed in the next town over, and they uh, decided they wanted to buy what's called the old Prolock farm in Ware. And they uh, go through and they get their approvals and sign-offs from the locals in a town meeting. They convince the townspeople that their group, who's there solely as a nonprofit, um, to purchase and protect in perpetuity farmlands. And people gobble it up, say, great, you know, <coughs> going under left and right to have a group that wants to protect a farm, I think that's good. Um, they were willing to uh, sign off, accept the grant from the government, okay, nothing's really for free, but they said they got free money. What wound up happening is that parcel went off the tax roll, so a proportional amount of tax burden has been shifted to the rest of the people in town. The uh, conservation restriction. We had to go through, and, and I, I tell you, I was twisting in the wind. I, I'm having a hard time with certain uh, people in my town convincing them of the, of the threat. They're coming on board more and more. But when this uh, was developing, I, I was a lone wolf out there, and I was looked at as a obstructionist. And they, they wanted to develop the language of the conservation restriction, but provide it to uh, our office after we signed all the papers and secured the grant money. <laughs> kind of a Nancy Pelosi moment. <laughs> and I said that, and boy did I catch some grief for that one, but that's exactly what it sounded like, because that's exactly what it was. And lo and behold, when the conservation restriction comes across my desk, and, and remember, these are in perpetuity. The government will only give land trust money to acquire property if the conservation restrictions are in perpetuity and forever is a very long time. Well, this group that was there to protect and preserve these farms forever had banned tractors. Had what? Banned Band tractors, tractors from the farm. <laughs> they could not put up any other out outbuildings. I, I think we, I did do some arm twisting. I absolutely flipped out over that. I said, how can you do that with a straight face? I, my first words to the director, I called her up and I said, Cynthia, is it possible that you put the language of, of another restriction and put Ware's name on it? Um, something's wrong here. She said, no, that's correct. And I said, well, come on into the office. We've got to have a little this and that. And we did. And I told her, I said, this is incredible. I can't believe you've actually done that. And our conservation's role is we own the restriction. Okay? They bought the development rights. A lot of times the property owner is still saddled with paying some of the taxes, but the property is not productive. That it will never go into pro any type of uh, productive um, capital of any kind. You will never be able to expand a house. I mean, what they have is what they get. That is it in perpetuity. Well, I managed to get the language about banning tractors out of the final draft. But that was about all I was able to do. And to prove to myself, because this was really a blow to me, what I thought were good groups, it turned out that they were part of the problem, is I asked her, I said, you know, I've got a litany, I've got a list that will go to the floor of all the restrictions you've applied on this property that's going to make it infeasible for whoever you get to buy or lease that property to make a legal go of it and have a, uh, an actual uh, business plan that is viable. And I said, give me one sentence under exemptions. 
exempt all agriculture related activity. She refused. Said my board won't go with it, I don't go for it, and the state won't go for it. And they didn't. So these land trusts and the grant money, the way it's set up, is designed to be abused. The rural pools that I mentioned, and 40 of them came in all at once. But I've got some rogue uh, environmental groups out there. And what they have done, if you go to the National Heritage website, you see in the red letters in the first paragraph, we recommend that you talk to property owners before going on to their property. It's not a law, it's not a requirement of filing these things. And I can go right here on Hal's laptop, and we got a site called MassGIS. If you live in Massachusetts, and I probably do the same thing for you in New Hampshire. I can go over and get your GPS <coughs> coordinates, and go over to Google Images and pull up a picture of a yellow spotted salamander, and plot that in there. I can fill out this form and hit the send button. And I'm here to tell you, none of these people are going to sashay their butts out of the office to go out and ground truth anything. They, they tell us that they don't ground truth this. Fisheries and wildlife are the ones that actually hold the certification do not ground truth this. What happens is some conservation office gets something in the mail saying we just, someone has certified a rural pool in your town. Now what I did is I didn't call up Natural Heritage right off the bat. I went to the assessor's office and I got the names of these people and I started calling property owners. And guess how many of them were notified someone was even on their property, let alone evaluating it? The old goose egg. Not one person knew that environmentalists were out evaluating their property. Mm -hmm. So you got yourself a vernal pool wherever the high ground or annual high water level is, plus 100 feet, can never be altered because of the language. There are farmers that are being fined and going to jail for walking through their fields at the wrong time of the year. Okay? A lot of ways this stuff is coming down. The environmentalists, they're, they're doing a heck of a job in creating overlays and things just like this. But in New Hampshire, there's vernal pools everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere. Are they going to be... Uh, They've got to have all the, the species that are in it, not just the morphological characteristics. They've got to have everything that the vernal pool needs to have. Um, but you're right, they are speckled all over the place. And at what point um, have we gone overboard? And who are we when you look at the science of this again? And I could apply this in a number of different ways, but a lot of times the science doesn't hold true. And when you're talking about protecting endangered species, okay, Diversity and, and habitats move. Anything, you get a static environment, you plant, get a, a field of corn and plant corn in it every year, what eventually happens? The soil goes, somehow the crop dies, disease, something happens. And it's that flood.